Coming to you live from the JRE Tobacco Aladino Mobile Studios, it's the Cigar Pulpit. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another sermon from the Cigar Pulpit. I'm your bishop of the Bird, Nick, and with me on his four-season room that he's that he's working on, but it's still very nice. We have Mr. Jonathan of Two What's Guys Smoke Shop and the Cigar Authority. What's How you going doing? on? Oh, not much. Living the dream here in St. Louis. We got great weather. Was able to sit out and enjoy some nice weather this weekend. I was uh, playing doctor to my seven-year-old this weekend. I pick him up Friday. He's perfectly fine. Saturday morning, that kid had no energy and then started throwing up. And it's like, well, this is awesome. So, you know, uh, he, he napped a lot, but the beauty of the napping a lot is uh he was napping on the couch and i was able to just pop right out the patio door sit on the patio and have my cigars all weekend long while he was sleeping so it worked out i love it i know right um anyway so today we uh we have a variety of different topics but first let's go ahead and get a cigar going so what are you smoking today uh today i opted to light up the alfonso number four in honor of Ooh. this, it, this is my vacation week. So uh, I'm a firm believer that you can't drink all day unless yeah. you start in the morning. So I got my bottle of uh, Callan. <laughs> this is uh, the classic cut Highland Scotch whiskey, single malt. It's, and, it's uh, awful low. On, again, you can't drink all day if you don't start <laughs> in the morning. Okay. Uh, and I got this Alfonso number four, which is tied for first place for the best cigar I've ever smoked in my life ever. This week's lineup is going to include this Alfonso number four that I saved for uh, this podcast. I also have an Atabe Black that I'm going to light up along with Corojo Reserves in my regular rotation. We'll get into that later. But okay. uh, yeah, this cigar features four years of cedar aging. And then one year of aging in a virgin French oak room, which is okay. the same oak that Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, the wine, is matured in. They make those wine casks out of that virgin oak. I've heard you talk about this one before. So yeah. it, it's a very long, involved process of essentially dry boxing, but it's dry boxing a warehouse of rolled cigars that are not banded and not cellophane yet. Some of them are in cedar cubicles. Some are in the oak cubicles. The humidity gets brought down to around 45% and then back up to 65% over and over, over the course of this four year and five year period. And what that does is it removes every iota of impurity from not just the tobacco, but from the cigar itself. And what you're left with is just concentrated, well-fermented, well-aged, very aromatic tobacco. Uh, I've got the windows closed in the four season room here. I'm going to, I'm going to pull an Ed Sullivan right now and I'm just going to smoke this place <laughs> out by myself. And I don't care because the smoke smells so good. There you go. I love the idea. And, uh, I ended up going into the humidor and I, I was telling you in via text before I have got to take an inventory because I'm not even 100 percent sure what I've got these days. And uh, but one thing I do know I have is I'm I'm working through the box of the uh, TAA Ciento Por Ciento, the brick house. From yeah. Casey Newman. I bought this from you guys, actually, uh, when that when that hit um, and. It's it's a all Nicaraguan cigar. I think it's like six and a quarter by fifty four, and I love this thing. It's it's that brick house that knows somebody. It's just that higher level of you know fun that that comes with it. And uh, I still have a couple of the twenty nineteen Ciento Por Cientos chilling in the humidor somewhere, but they're buried back in the back, and I can't. I don't remember exactly where they're at. So I need to. That's why I need to get in there and circle around rumor floating around about the 2019 version was that jc newman found some of that size in a small quantity like ten thousand cigars yeah of the original blend that were done in the old factory 
So oh. they kept some of those to reverse engineer and get the flavor of the new ones to be similar, but okay. or, or as close as you can get. But I believe that first run was original brick house when it was five dollars a cigar and they were made i don't remember the name of the other factory but they had built their own factory now and they're they're really coming into their own with that factory if that's the case then those brick house for five bucks back when they came out that was ridiculous it was such an amazing cigar yeah yeah no that's 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 ridiculous well let's go ahead and get these things cut and lit because i want to get going on the cigar here so Time to cut the cigar, and the official cutting is brought to you by Dan the Man Ponder at Riverman Cigar Company of Crestwood, Missouri. And guys, if you're looking for uh, all things J.C. Newman or even Arturo Fuente, you can head on over to Riverman Cigar Company because he's got uh, quite the uh, connection there with Mr. Jake, the, uh, the the rep and sales director on this half of the country. And, uh, you know, he gets all kinds of great um hard find uh newman and fuente cigars that you can pick up over there and enjoy and if you're not in the st louis area but you still want to get a hold of some of those great cigars you can give him a call because dan does do mail order and he can get a box of cigars sent to you right away it's riverman cigar company of crestwood missouri and now we'll go ahead and cut the cigar nice cutter just because you cut your cigars know, using right? what i use doesn't mean you can yeah. be me i get that i actually bought this from you not surprised i was up at uh it was when i came up for the anniversary party in 22 i didn't have mine and actually i had the old version the old model so i had some screw issues going on with it so that and... was the second run of these they they used the wrong loctite and okay. the first run was immaculate and this is first run the second okay. run had those screws that backed out and then the third run and forward they were back to their uh, original glory I'm going to get okay. off the mic just for one second. I put my ashtray too far away. Stand by. Uh, no problem. So I gave this guy a cut, and I'll go ahead and do a cold draw here. I don't know if I've, I don't know if I've had one of these on the show or not, to be honest. Um, I know I had the 2019. I can't remember if I've done the 23. I probably did, to be honest. I don't know. I'm back. Okay. So, a little barnyard, a little, little sweetness. Not, I don't necessarily want to say raisiny, but a little sweetness to it. So, I don't know if you've ever smelled the inside. And this is going to sound like such a shitty description, but this is exactly <laughs> what it is. Cinnamon Chinese pea pods. Have you ever smelled the inside of an El Producto box after the cigars are gone? No. It is really raisiny tobacco okay so i could have said this is raisiny tobacco but it for people that have ever my grandfather smoked el producto so i'm very familiar with the inside of that box smell because he would give us boxes as little presents would come over and help him work in the garage or whatever and he'd yeah. say here take an empty box to put your rocks in or whatever and i just remember associating that smell with him the cold drawer of this takes me all the way back to that early early memory of that raisiny tobacco flavor slash smell all right i'm even going to leave the get your rocks off of your grandfather's box joke away and leave that alone um but uh <laughs> or i can just throw it out there for i think for you just did just, throw it out there you for just to just languish and die but that's okay <laughs> anyway oh god I'm getting this thing lit. So uh, before we get into the business of the day, how the hell you been? I've been great. I've been uh, just working on the house and I scheduled my vacation for the week after March Madness by design. It's the slowest sales week. And as the manager, I like to be there anytime that there are uh, events that are going on. So I schedule my vacations around when there's little to nothing or nothing going on and that happens to be this week perfect well um before i, I want to talk to you about the march madness sale but before we do i want to um i want i want to thank you because um you know everybody uh that listens to cigar authority that knows you you know they 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 uh you know they kind of tend to uh 
think I'm a dick. Perce- yeah, they perceive you as an asshole. They they see you have this persona that you're just a dick, you know, and everything. And so I just want to say for the record that as we sit here and record um, Monday afternoon, that it was less than 18 hours ago that I sent you a message saying that I know it's super last minute. What are the odds you're free to do a podcast tomorrow? And within minutes, you got back to me and you're like, I can do it. What time? And it's one of those things that between the newspaper and, you know, my my son and just a lot of other different life events, I've been super busy lately. And I will freely admit I have been really bad about building, taking time to build out the calendar, get invites sent out, schedule things out. And so I've kind of scrambled a little bit. That's why there was a solo show on Friday. That's why I text you, you know, 18 you hours ago. It. You absolutely and... killed it. Dave was right on that that show. I, I finished listening to listening to it this morning because I, I didn't want you to reference that show and me having not listened to it. Uh, you hit every single major point exactly on the head. Uh, you actually didn't even have to say, listen, this is really for the retailers out there because the consumer needs to understand a couple of things. The consumer needs to understand the concept of burning through dead product and don't abuse your brick and mortar retailer and buy only the stuff that they're offering on deal. Those should be considered by the consumer to be add-ons to the sale. You go in and you get your $12 per domo and do the right thing because you like to have a place to smoke. You like yeah. to have a place to go and get your cigars now, but also uh, a part that you are actually a little more kind than I think I liked. I, I would have gone a little more for the jugular, not supporting the companies that are going to put the little guy out of business. And that includes not buying those cigars from your brick and mortar. And you could do, you can do some easy research on this. The cigars that appear out of nowhere to be sold at less than cost a yeah. couple times a year on certain websites. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those websites own those cigars. They own those trademarks. And those <laughs> companies, believe me, when they put the last brick and mortar business out of business, their prices are going to go right up to where beyond where they are at your local brick and mortar. You will not have a place to smoke. You will not have a convenient way to get your cigars. They will not keep their brick and mortar stores open because they are terrible at retail. I understand you had a great experience, but by and large, yeah. those massive companies, I actually hope they open next to me. I will bury them because my oh. customer service is better than theirs. For sure. I will For win sure. on every transaction in that way. Well, I appreciate that. And but to finish my thought, I appreciate you taking time out like so quickly. And especially knowing it's your vacation week, I, I really do appreciate it. Um, so you're not as much of a dick as everybody says you are. I kind of am, but well, all right. You're welcome. Well, anyway. Um, well, no, and you know that's what it is? What, people that? people mistake me being direct and saying exact when you deal with me. On a personal level, I was having a conversation with my friend Eric who wanted to come over and see the room and he needed a, a warm place to smoke a cigar. And I said, come on over. And we smoked a cigar together and he still had some of his, uh, he bought an expensive box of cigars uh, last week. So he's smoking his $40 Distinguidos Byron and he still had about half of it left and I was done mine. And I said, I hope you don't mind, but uh, I got a podcast at one. So I'm going to finished trimming out this light switch here and taking my measurements and he finished his cigar while I did that and we continued shooting the shit. Yeah. Um, but the conversation was about uh, people get butt hurt when you're direct and it's not me. That's the asshole. It's the person that's too sensitive and can't handle the truth now. True. And that's what, and, and li- this is why Dave and I get along so well is because we both deliver the truth now and not sugarcoat it. It's not about someone's feelings. It's about, all right, where, where are we going with this? Are we living life to be truthful or are we living life to protect everybody? Well, and I'd also take that one step further and say, it's not just a matter of people don't like hearing the truth right away. Like you're saying, hear the truth now. It's that everybody can't handle the fact that uh, people have different opinions and different thoughts on the matter, you know, whatever the matter happens to be. And so nobody wants to hear 
dissenting thoughts. I mean, look, I don't know what a lectin is. Um, and I love certain foods that you don't, but you know what? I'm not going to judge you for, for, you know, eating like only meat and, and ignoring the pasta and all that, because by God, that leaves more pasta for me. So that's true. There, there yeah. is a shortage in the world of pasta and it, and if someone's going to consume <laughs> it, it should be you. I agree. Damn it. Oh, um, and how come Ed Sullivan doesn't get the title of being Dick? That dude is so vicious with some of his comebacks so this vicious is, yeah but he's so funny with it because it's like he just comes out of absolutely nowhere with his just cutting remarks now the the other thing i would say about that he's very like calm and collected with it you tend to get very animated and sometimes a little like it's it's your demeanor you come across a little like loud and mean whereas if you just like said some of this shit at like the deadpan kind of tone that he has you know maybe it would i'll take that under a little advisement. funnier i'm just telling you you know, I might do it. So I wanted to talk about the March Madness sale because it kind of piggybacks into what I talked about uh, to an extent in that show Friday about CI coming to St. Louis, which is the need to, um, and you touched on it or just a bit ago, uh, clear out dead inventory, you know, and the need to um, keep track of what you've got, keep track of what's actually selling. And if it's not selling, to get rid of it, get it off the shelves because it's just taking up space. And so um, maybe d- for those listeners who, who, you know, aren't familiar with your sale, maybe just kind of educate them as to what that would be. So what happens for the March Madness sale is, is a couple of things. We accomplish a couple of objectives with this particular event. We go through a lot of dead product and free up that capital. And yes, the product gets sold in some cases for less than what we paid for it, but somewhere around the two year mark of staring at the same shit, it has to go. It has to go, go. So the price has to be so low that if it's the worst cigar you've ever smoked in your life, you'll still buy it. And those will be the ones you give out on the golf course to the three other mooches that you don't want to give up uh, a good cigar for. Which Uh, every cigar smoker should have an inventory of those because at some point or another, somebody's going to ask you for a cigar. And if you don't want to give up one of your good ones, you got to have some shitty ones sitting around that you can give them. 100% true. Yeah. yeah. So it, it accomplishes blowing through dead product. It also accomplishes a little gift to the cigar smokers that frequent our shop. Most of the people that show up and it's 1200 or so that come cycling through for the event. Most of the people are regular customers and it gives them a little incentive where there's also some, a percentage off of everything. Okay. So if you follow us on social media, you'll know the percentage. I'm not looking to blow anything up here. So in that respect, but there's a certain percentage off across the board. And then what most people do is they come in and they get their regular cigars and then they go shopping on the deal table for the exact thing that I said to you. And some things are sleepers on that deal table where, oh, my God, this cigar only came out one time and two guys smoke shop bought too many of them. They sold mm-hmm. well and maybe the store sold out of their inventory, but mail order ended up carrying it because it didn't have the same hype or vice versa. So we've got product where, all right, this was a one time release. It was highly sought after and it just didn't sell out because we bought too many. There's a a myriad of reasons why you end up with product that would be on the sale table or in the sale bin. But in our case, we rip it off like a bandaid all at once and say, all right, this is the stuff that's going to be on the 40 or 50% off table or the two for a hundred table and just dump it, make the price so good. They can't say no. And even if you lost money on it, at least now you have that capital freed up and more important than the capital is the space. Oh, for sure. I mean, I hear that from retailers all the time that they just don't have space for new stuff coming in and they've got to figure out, you know, how to rearrange the human order for this and this and this and whatever. But, you know, to your point about the capital, um, you know, if a retailer is sitting there and they're saying to themselves, well, I spent a hundred bucks per box to bring this in and I don't want to lose money on it every year. It sits there. That's just money tied up. And even if you take a loss on it, you've absorbed that loss. However, many years ago to where it's just more money in your pocket. Now 
that you, you can literally reinvest and already put into lost something. money on it because you paid somebody to handle that cigar or that box of cigars. How many times mm-hmm. between when you took it in and when we're talking about? So if you held on to it for three years, most likely that box of cigars was moved four times a year. You paid someone to do that. You also paid for shipping for it to get to you. And then you paid it for it to move four times a year. So if this is the third year, it's been moved 12 times that was unnecessary. By the second year, if you got rid of it, that employee that was paid to move that box is moving a box that actually moves. Yeah. And that's we find at our March Madness sale that our number of tables that we have with dead product, that number gets smaller and smaller. And people come in and they go, Wow, it's not like back in the day when the there were these unbelievable deals. Yeah, because you're well, buying better. We're buying better. Yeah. And less companies are discontinuing product. So if uh, Padron, I believe, discontinued the, uh, they, I know for a fact, they discontinued making the Delicious size. With, in the 1,000 okay. series, it's the only one that has a name. It's not a 1,000. It's a Delicious. So okay. they discontinued that, and that was on one of the tables three years ago. That's an unbelievable find for a consumer to walk in and get a deep discount on a, on a cigar that you never see discounted anywhere ever. For sure. So a consumer walking in might say, Oh, why don't you put more Padrones on the discount table? Well, because that doesn't make sense. We we're going to sell them. We're going to sell every single one that particular one dead size needed to be made to go away so that we can buy more two thousands and three thousands. Gotcha. So then um, in terms of how you like manage this, um, obviously, I mean, I know you guys have a POS system. So I assume when you enter this product in prior to the sale, you enter it in at the discount and that way somebody can't come up with like some other cigar and be like, Oh, I found this on the table and it, it's 50% off or something like that. You know, you, Oh, they try it. And, and we say, okay, let me just scan that and see what it comes up as. Yeah. Oh, this is the global discount for everything. Sorry uh-huh. that it was on the table. Someone must've put it there. If a retailer does not have a POS system and their own system for barcoding. So I can, this is not proprietary information. Yeah. Two guys smoke shop. The first letter of the brand gets a number. A gets one. So Aladinos and Atabays all start with zero one. And all the way down to the letter Z, which is two six. So those first two numbers of our six number barcodes are all based on the letter of the alphabet. Okay. And then the you've got a thousand other uh possibilities after it right probably more than that i'm terrible with the exponential nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine actually but all right perfect so yeah. we're never gonna run out <laughs> never uh so with our barcode system we know if the barcode is incorrect or if it's correct based on the first two numbers and the letter of the the alphabet blah 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 but yeah i can dial in the down to percentage points of what's in the bottom 10%, what's in the top 10%. And we look at it every day to see what the fluctuation is. And certainly we dive deep every month because we want to know what brands are rising, what brands are dropping, because it's important data for the buyer to know, listen, brand X is on its way down. You can ease up on this because we're seeing a downtrend. And sometimes it's a downtrend just in my store in Salem. Sometimes it's a downtrend just in the Seabrook or the Nashua stores. But when we look at that data, we can really see what where things are going and what's coming up and what's coming down. And when at the end of the year, when something's in the bottom 10%, it gets axed. Yeah. But we knew it was in the bottom 10% in the middle of the year. And it goes on the buyer's radar and say, listen, you got to look at brand X because it's not selling like it used to. You should ease up and let's see if we can make this, we can buy the inventory down on brand X and Y and Z so that it doesn't hit the March Madness table. It sells out exactly at the end of the year. And and we, we get to do that on five or six brands. Some of them 
the deal was too good, whatever. It was bought too early before we saw the writing on the wall. But most of the time, we can catch it. Okay. Interesting. That's the thing. It's all about watching the data and and have well having the data and watching the data because you know as you just pointed out it helps with your buyer which then leads back to what you were saying earlier about how consumers are coming and saying oh there's less stuff on the table and blah 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 it's like you know you've got Ed and and uh, I guess Dave I mean you know I I think we could probably put something shiny in front of Dave and as long as it's got a good gimmick we could sell him on it but um you yes know, and but no. He, the, the <laughs> one thing that dude can do is figure uh, – he can figure out margin in his brain and he can uh, he can recognize and he's he's batting like 850 when it comes that's, to – No, and see, and that's a good average because let's nobody's batting 1,000. Correct. Yeah. So now you guys only do this sale one time a year. That's it. Okay. Well, that makes sense then. It's one time a year. You clear it out. And I guess it's kind of convenient um, – especially this year because it's happening, you know, what, weeks before PCA. So you clear it all out, and then PCA happens, and Ed can go out to uh, to Vegas or, I guess, New Orleans next year and, you know, fill all that room back up. Right, and when it takes the manufacturer three months to fulfill the order, that mm-hmm. gives us the extra time to be able to uh, rearrange things. You know, things get spread out, and you spread yourself thin when you don't have enough product. But then the stuff starts trickling in and you're you get tighter and tighter in your cases. And then it gets to the breaking point of, all right, let's start discontinuing some shit because we're out of space. So do you pull stuff throughout the year and yes. stick it aside if it's like not moving in order to make yeah, space? So, OK, uh, I would say by the end of the first quarter, I start running reports for myself and I say, OK, uh, Ed, this is what's going on. This stuff is has not moved yet. So I'd like to put it on your radar and maybe you slow down on your buying. And so he makes that decision, yay or nay, based on the other information he's getting from the other stores and what's selling online. And honestly, sometimes stuff is killing it online because yeah. you have the entire country that you're dealing with. And in the pocket of our three state or four state area, it's just not moving because it, it hasn't hit that popularity yet or it's never going to. So yeah. he'll say, well, we're going to keep it. You can send me your product because I can move it online. All right, no problem. But at the end of that first quarter, I'm I'm it's already on my radar. I'm thinking of next year's March Madness and how do I make those tables smaller and smaller and how do I give myself enough space to stay wide because the American consumer can only see 36 inches wide on a shelf. Okay. This is data from Nick Perdomo who met with the folks at Google and they ran studies with high end cameras and people's uh, scanning people's vision. And all right, the, on the shelf, they can see 36 inches or greater. So if my, if I have four boxes and they're stacked uh, Robusto, Toro, Churchill, Gordo, and they're on top of each other and they all fit into a two foot space. There is no way the American consumer is going to see that product period. They have to be shown it at that point. Okay. So if I could get those spread out and I can get rid of the four boxes of cigars next to it, and I can spread that out to the full 36 inches, it'll sell itself. If it looks like the cigars that that consumer smokes, meaning Connecticut shade, sun grown Maduro, whatever. That's the that that part becomes everything when you talk about silent salesmen and silent salesmen is about 20 percent of the business. OK, so like the color and the, the flaps with the data and everything that are in the box. And we've talked about this before. Yeah. Putting the box price on the cigar with the discount oh, yeah. already figured in this. There's, there's a lot of stuff that happens, but that all die. If you do it all perfectly, you can change your business by about 20 percent. 80% of it is having a good staff and having a good product mix so that you can put the right product in the right customer's hands. Gotcha. Interesting. Well, I, you know, it, like I said, it was one of those things I talked about a lot of stuff on, I talked a lot about stuff on Friday and it just kind of happened. I didn't even realize that that was the, the day. Cause you guys always do it. What the first Friday of March, first Friday. Yep. 
Okay. And it just so happened that that was March 1st. And so then later in the day, I'm seeing the posts about your sale and I'm thinking, well, shit, this actually is super relevant. So it kind of worked out that uh, it timed out that way because, you know, um, like when I does said, this podcast just, post tomorrow, Tuesday? Oh, perfect. You're going to it's going to look like we copied you. Ha! Uh, our oh, after you... show actually is talking a little bit about this topic. Holy uh, shit. And about killing dead product and the whole bit. Well, by God, for once, I'm coming out ahead of you with something. I love it. And that was completely <laughs> organic, Dave, because I know you listen and it's going to look like I, I copied the after show. No, <laughs> Nick hit me up and he said, this is what we were talking about. And I just said, yes, it's true. It's true. Oh, that's funny. I like it. Well, cool. Um, well, let's go ahead and do this now. It's time for the Villager Cigars Entertainment Report, brought to you by Villager. Villager Cigars, one of the leading cigar and cigarello manufacturers in the world, founded in 1888 and still family-owned and operated. Head over to VilligerCigars.com and check the store locator to find a shop near you that carries them. We guarantee that Villager Cigars will be a wonderful addition to your humidor and cigar rotation. So I am pulling up my list. Oh, wait. That's not even relevant for this segment. <laughs> anyway, that's the next segment I'm getting ready for already. Um, anyway, so what have you been entertained by here lately? So I found, I don't know if you remember it. It was on Comedy Central back before Comedy Central was woke. Uh, it was a, nothing a but show South Park. Yeah, it was a show called Tough Crowd with Colin Quinn. I remember Colin Quinn. I don't know if I'm necessarily thinking of the same show. But uh, I, I think he's only Colin ever had Quinn. one show. To his OK, own. well, then, yeah. So then I probably am thinking of it then. It was in the late 90s, early 2000s. And it he is unquestionably a what we would consider now to be a right wing conservative. OK. In the day, he was just a comedian. Who felt a certain way about certain shit and felt other ways about other shit. And he would have his his comedian buddies on and some of them would be considered by today's standard to be liberal okay they all shit on everybody uh some of the episodes are when george bush is in office and colin quinn who is clearly <laughs> in the tank for the republican party as far as how he's voting and he shits all over george bush because George Bush was an idiot <laughs> and he deserved it. And he shit all over Bill Clinton because he was a douchebag and he deserved it. There you and go. The other comedians that would be some liberal, some conservative, they all shit on everybody. And I watch it because I remember a time when you could be friends with somebody that voted different than you. And honestly, and truly most of my friends, I have that relationship with, I have plenty of friends that vote just straight left and plenty of friends that vote straight, right. And we can get along and we can shit on everybody and it's all good. And this just brings me back to that time. Uh, so that's one of the shows I've been watching, especially with Patrice O'Neill, who is surprisingly conservative on certain stuff and very liberal on other stuff. And he just has such an impressive take or had he's, no longer with us yeah. had such an impressive take and so quick on his feet so good i you know i agree with you i i do miss the days when we could just you know agree to disagree and whatnot on politics i mean it just i you know i'm coming at it um not to get into personal life stuff or anything i found that dating has been very difficult in that regard that you know and and to be honest, if I'm like on an app and swiping, if somebody's got some sort of like, you know, uh, that they're super into politics or they they say like, you know, uh, you need to vote or, or they list off like issue issues that they're into. It's an immediate turnoff. It's like there's so much more to life than caring about this issue or that issue it's it, i just i move on from that for me it was it, and i'm no longer on the apps but the it's i got turned off by the never trumpers 
mm-hmm. and the always Trumpers. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. Trump can do no wrong, and Trump's the devil. Oh, because let me because yeah, because the always Trumpers, their whole profile is based entirely around that. Just and then the never Trumpers, it's this. It, I mean, it's like the derangement syndrome goes both ways on that one. You know, it's like. Uh, anyway, that's neither here nor there. But but yeah, no, I, I wish we could get back to the day. I was always told growing up. There's two things that in in pleasant company, you don't discuss politics and religion. And I just wish we could get back to that point in society again. You know what? I agree with you in some ways and I disagree with you in others. I think we need to get back to a place where I think the the late 90s, early 2000s was the ideal time where you could have a conversation with somebody and agree to disagree and you could still be friends. Yeah. And and then it was an anomaly. I, I, I grew up very poor. So we had our poor white neighborhood was adjacent to the poor Hispanic neighborhood and it was adjacent to the poor black neighborhood. And honestly, if you could play basketball and you had a halfway decent jumper and a decent crossover, you could go to any <laughs> basketball court and, and you'd be fine. make friends. And I'm still friends with these kids today because no one gave a shit. Yep. Then now I feel like we give a shit too much about skin color and the creed and all that bullshit. Just stop. I thought we a were shit. in a, I thought after Obama, we were in a post-racial world, though. I think after Obama, <laughs> we became the most racist that we've ever been in the history of the country. And I'm going back to slavery. I see. <laughs> it's definitely much more on everybody's mind because you can't um, listen. I'm not I am not trying to get canceled. And honestly, I, I was going to say, do. I'm like, dude, we can but move on from this. If you want, I but. don't I don't care so much about someone's skin color or their religion. I don't care at all. I have close friends that are Muslim. And when someone blows something up or kills somebody and they're Muslim, I don't hold it against the guy that I know is a good guy. Right. And he ends up being like, I'm sorry, my religion killed that person or blew that shit up. That wasn't. And I'm like, I know it wasn't you. Yeah. You're a good person. I know I we, we've gotten away from the ability to judge a person by their character the content of their character. Yep. 100%. That's exactly it. So, yeah, we're, we're definitely not living the dream these days. But and uh, listen, there is you know. there is a difference between somebody that was raised as a black person and someone that was raised as a white person. No, I don't think that their opportunities are any less. But culturally speaking. There, there's certain things that are unique to white people and there's certain things that are unique to black people. And I love learning about the different cultures. For sure. So quick story about, I have a, a group of customers that are from Kenya. Okay. Maybe I told the story before. I don't know, but uh, I don't know. They're from Kenya and we're doing a send off party and they, they say, we're going to do a roast for this guy, Mark. He's going to Kenya. He's starting a cigar store, uh, a lounge, cigar lounge in Kenya. And they have no idea what a roast is. So everybody that gets up. So I start off, I'm sort of hosting. And I get on the Oh, so this is a comedic roast, not like a pig roast. They had a goat, but that was a different thing. Okay. Okay. All right. (laughs) It's comedic roast. Okay. So I open things up and I'm breaking Mark's balls about stuff I know about Mark and people are laughing. And then the first guy gets up and he ends his speech in tears about how good Mark's always been to him. And I take the mic from him and I go, holy shit, that was depressing. And I rip into Mark about a couple more things. The next guy gets up and it's even more heartfelt than the first one. The whole room is practically crying. So I get up and I'm whatever. Yeah. So this guy gets up and he says, listen, Mr. Jonathan has been very good to us. I think it's, in t- it's time that we induct him into our tribe. So I lean over to my Kenyan buddy, Patrick, and I go, what the fuck does that mean? He goes, well, we're going to have to pick a, a, a name for you. And I go, a name? And he goes, well, you know how we call Eddie Odish? Well, Odish means something in in um, Kikuyu, their, their okay. native tongue. And I'm like, all right, cool. So someone shouts out, let's call him they gay. And I go, what's they gay? He goes, Billy Goat. I go, vetoed. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> Billy Goat. He goes, you don't get to pick it. I go, fucking vetoed. 
Whatever the thing you have to say, Kikuyu, that says not that, let's move on. You say that right now. <laughs> and he waves his hand like this. So then they say, um, Degwa. I go, what's Degwa? He goes, it means the bull. I go, I'll take that. He goes, you don't get to pick. I go, fucking second it right now. And he stands <laughs> up and goes, I second Degwa. Someone else says, I third Degwa. So right at the end of this ritual, the, the this guy, Sam, walks up. He's 6'4", and he's 230. He's just a massive man, and he holds out a silver platter, and on the platter is a testicle sliced into four pieces. I don't bat an eye. I grab the biggest piece of this testicle. I pop it in my mouth. I chew it exactly twice, and I swallow it as fast as I can. And I just try not to think about the gaminess, and I'm not thinking about gagging. You know you're feeding the trolls at this point, right? That's okay. The okay. room goes <laughs> electric. Dudes take their shirts off. They're swinging them. They're standing on now the tables. Now you're definitely feeding the trolls. <laughs> and I go, Pat, what just happened? And he goes, you fucked up. I'm like, how did I fuck up? I've been Kenyan for six fucking minutes. How yeah. did I fuck up? And he goes, that was kidney. And that's reserved exclusively for the women. And I oh, go, that's no, that, that wasn't testicle. And he goes, you ate it thinking it was testicle. I'm like, I don't know your culture. I'm trying to fit in here. You guys honor me with this, this new name. And I'm now I'm a Kenyan and I'm honored. And I just want to fit in. And I ate the thing the guy fucking handed me. And you're saying it's kidney and it's women's food. He goes, don't worry. The fine won't be too much. Oh, no. I'm like, all right, these guys are fleecing me now. Like, I, I saw them <laughs> in a different light. All right, I'm getting fleeced. I'm ready for this. Uh huh. So Sam gets up on the microphone. He goes, as you guys know, Degua ate the women's food, the kidney. Uh, we need to process his fine now. So how much is it, the, the going rate for a goat? Who bought the goat for today? And it was this other dude that ate the kidney, who's Kenyan, who should have known better. And yeah. he goes, oh, I paid 300 He goes, all right, the fine for the goat is assessed at 300 and he bangs a gavel. Where did he get the gavel? I have no idea. There was no <laughs> gavel, but he bangs a gavel. I'm like, all right, I got set up. How much is it for the charcoal? It's $100. I'm like, I will, I will supply the charcoal. Nope, you can't supply the charcoal. It's $100. Uh, how much to cook the goat? I go, I got this. I will cook the best goat you've ever had in your entire life. I have a smoker. It's all set. They go, nope, you can't cook the goat. Uh, we pay a guy for that. It's $100, so $500 assessment. Oh, shit. One, one by one, a different Kenyan stands up and vouches for $100. My assistant, Trevor, who was there, stands up for 100 It's down to 100 for me. I peel off a beaner. I put it on the table. Debt's paid. It's all set. At the end of the night, Mark comes up and says, this is the guy we're roasting. He says, we were just fucking with you. Here's your hundred dollars back. There is no <laughs> assessment. That was dirty pool. We don't play like that. And it was great. Did you look at him and say that's Mr. Degwa to you? <laughs> I should have. I'm instantly regretting my life to say I was gonna say, Mr. Degwa. So oh fuck. Um, so okay. Uh aside from Colin Quinn, what else have you been watching lately? <laughs> I like uh, the side story though. That was good. I'm going to give you the uh the plug here because your um big box store episode I listened to twice. Oh it's shit. Very good. Very well done. You did your research. You were 100% spot on. And any retailer that hears that episode should heed your warning. I the only thing I disagree with is having a $5 bin and having that available all the time and not because I don't think the customers will do the right thing. Yeah. You will eventually create a mooch market. And if you do that even four times a year, or you have uh, four times a year, you make your dead product available or once a year you do a sale like March madness in some way you need to rip that off like a bandaid because the consumer will eventually become the mooch. And that's why most people don't do this. Well, no, and that's fair. I only threw out the $5 bin idea basically as a way to move the dead product. But, you know, in hindsight, looking at, you know, talking to you about the sale and everything, 
the sale is a perfectly viable and probably even better option because as as you point out it doesn't create that that mooch culture that just you know permeates and and people then never look to the the regular product they only look at the bargain bin. Uh, another thing that you could do is a blind grab bag you put inside a um, brown paper bag you put 10 cigars and you charge 50 bucks and maybe you have uh say a private label brand for your your store and you put a couple of those in there and then you put seven dead cigars that of stuff you're trying to get rid of and you sell that for 50 bucks so that puts them at five dollars they're blind and then you have an advertisement opportunity when they look around your store and they don't see the other brands but they see the three brands that you put in that you had for private label that's another way to to flush through product and not kill yourself on margin and also advertise for your own brands and you don't have those available all the time and you wait until after the transaction's over and you say oh by the way we have these grab bags you know if you're interested they're fifty dollars and there's ten cigars in there or they're twenty five dollars yeah. and there's five cigars in there gotcha and you okay. treat it like an add-on and your your guys at the register you know once the guys not after the transaction i'm sorry after the guy's done his shopping and you yeah. say hey listen you want to add on 25 bucks there's five cigars in this bag and no one knows what they are some of it's dead product some of it's live product but it's just a really good deal that we're offering this month and then the guy knows it's only for this month he can't come in and buy 50 grab bags you know you could put a limit of two there's lots of ways to be able to move through some dead product that it doesn't have to be just a straight five dollar bin or have a sale like we do at march madness there's lots of other ways to be creative to blow through dead product oh for sure i mean so i don't know if it's everywhere or if it's just based in st louis but there's a uh um uh nonprofit here called backstoppers and what they do and and i'm sure they have things like this all over the place but they, they raise money and uh they support the families of fallen first responders so if a policeman fireman ems whatever falls in the line of duty um backstoppers is one of the first people to reach out to the widow and say okay here's the deal do you we're need cigars well no we're, we're paying off your house we're paying off your bills and your kids are covered through college you know that kind of thing like we've got you and so they raise money all the time well to that point there's a sh uh, shop over here um, in the Hill neighborhood, which is like a little Italian neighborhood, and it's the Hill Cigar Company, and they uh, uh, have little four count grab bags on the counter, and it's it's product that, admittedly, probably moves slowly, uh, if not they they're mo dead products that they're moving. But it's four cigars for 25 bucks and the profits go to backstoppers. So not only are you looking at it and you're like, hey, you know what? That's four cigars for 25 bucks. That's not a bad deal. But then when you see that extra little, oh, it's going to support the families of fallen first responders. It's just that much extra. They move through those all the time. That's awesome. Yeah. It's it's not only it's an awesome sentiment. And listen, Cigars for Warriors also has its place. Uh, uh -huh. We talk about this on the after show this week where, you know, when should you, the consumer, go through your dead product and make room in your humidor so that you can buy the stuff you're into. Uh, and Cigars for Warriors is an easy donation. And honestly, because it's because it's a 501c3, I think you as a person can get a tax deduction based on the amount that you paid for the cigars that you're donating. Oh, that's nice. That's actually not a bad thought. Um, especially we're in tax season, you can, you can add that to your donation list of the value and it's not a complete loss. You just probably have to retain receipts. Why? Well, I don't know. I mean, well, they'll give you a receipt for what you donated. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, so that's true. Okay. There's your, I'm there's saying your that value. Like, okay. All right. Cause that's the thing. I'm like, eh. I keep my receipts because you know, well, Tax, cigars are a tax write-off for you completely oh for sure it's research and development yes and <laughs> gifts don't forget oh, gifts i didn't even think about gifts okay no so that's I, not a I also thought. saved my receipts uh from the liquor store just oh, nice I, I i've never done that either but um 
<laughs> anyway, um, well, I, I, as I said earlier, I spent the weekend with my kids, so I've watched a lot of Clifford the Big Red Dog this weekend, specifically the episode about the potluck party. He, he wanted to watch that on repeat practically, so um, I know all about the potluck party that uh, uh, the little girl that uh, Elizabeth something i don't so remember. i i anyway, think you need so yeah. you need a co2 detector because i think the co2 is a little or the carbon monoxide is a little high in your house <laughs> because you were willing to sit through it your kid wanted to so that there's a problem there I, you there's know what problem. it's it's what you do it's just what you do so um but yeah so i did uh manage to get through um most of your episode from saturday this morning before we got on and i'm trying to no wait i finished it i finished it on youtube that's right um and so uh you guys did the uh the survey and i just want to point out for the record that the question about other cigar podcasts that you listen to you know i came in third none came in second and then obviously the Ashles came in first i kind of contend that if none was the answer then that means that I then take the second place spot. You know what? That's an interesting take because I took it as people would rather listen to nothing than listen to your show. But I like your take better. It's I nicer. Mean, I it's look nicer. on the bright. I look on the bright side of it, <laughs> and yeah. So I'm I'm gonna take it as uh, as that uh, I took the second place spot because you know none I don't feel is a proper answer. I think you earned it. Yeah, I think so. I think you are. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, well, why don't we go ahead and do this now? Guess what, motherfucker? Time for three cigars we smoked and enjoyed this week. And uh, that's what I was prepping for earlier when I was looking on my phone. So um, what have you smoked and enjoyed this week? I am smoking the ever loving shit out of the McAuliffe Black Toro. Yeah. I know it's cigar of the year, blah, blah, blah. But I was on this cigar from day one and it slowly weaseled its way, not only into my regular rotation, but into my multi smokes per day rotation. And just so people know, I'm good for six to eight a day. Sometimes I smoke all day at work and I come home into my little Shangri-La that I'm building and I kick on the heater and I rip one for me just to sit back and chill out. And when I get a TV in here and I can watch my YouTube videos, it's going to be, I'm never leaving this room. Nice. Nice. Um, so my first one uh, is one that I actually smoked in the car and it was uh, the intemperance Volstead in the Bellicoso size. Very good. Holy shit. That thing was a freaking smokestack and it was so like, it was very flavorful. I really dug it. Skip launched that cigar with us at two guys and the free release cigar had a different wrapper. Yeah. And I really enjoyed the different wrapper. And then the regular one came out and I was like, all right, this is, this is one of the ways where, you know, a manufacturer actually has it going on better burn more flavor from the other wrapper. And they look, excuse me. They look, almost identical but the new wrapper that he picked was that was the right choice for him gotcha so what was your second one well i smoked a uh a byron distinguidos at the tail end of the march madness sale just to kind of celebrate that this was it this was the last hour it's our last hurrah and Oh man, was that outstanding? That's nice. Um, what was the Byron that uh was in the show pack? God, I feel like it was maybe December. Yeah, that was the Byron eighteen fifty grand bouquet. I'm it's still sitting on sixty five dollar cigar. Yeah. Listen, given how many lectins you consume and given your current diet <laughs> where you prefer pasta over meat. Uh, you should smoke that sooner rather than later because okay. some jackass is going to take two puffs of that and say, ah, you know what? 
I'm really not into cigars and throw it away and you will have not enjoyed it. So you should smoke that shit sooner rather than later. Oh, no, that one's not given getting given away to anybody. That one's no, 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 no. You'll be dead. You'll have died. Oh, oh, someone's going to inherit your collection or buy it from an estate sale. And they're going to be like, oh, this motherfucker had this dark cigar. I (laughs) I think I like dark cigars. They're going to take two puffs and go, I don't like cigars. They're going to throw it away. And you will have missed out on smoking it. That cigar will change your life and it will change how you evaluate cigars forever. Well, that's the thing is I didn't. No offense. Normally, I like smoking along with you guys. That one I didn't want to because I wanted to actually focus on it. And I'm like, I don't really know if I want, you know, because I'll be honest that that when I fire that thing up, that will be the most expensive cigar I've ever smoked. All right. So like MSRP, you, you have that in your humidor and yeah. we're going back and forth about what to smoke today. And I'm telling you, I'm smoking Alfonso number four. And I grab a brick house. And you Porciento. grab a fucking brick house. <laughs> you had dude, a chance to really I, celebrate today. I wanted to. I, I truly don't want to just mindlessly smoke it i want something or i want to take the opportunity where i really have the opportunity to concentrate fully on it yeah you could have smoked the first half on the show and then you could be less long-winded end the show early and then fucking finish it oh come on, on. Your time you and me long uh, uh, i know it's less ridiculous. long-winded i was gonna oh say, speaking of which on. i want to finish my little villager report the cat oh, okay. williams joe I'm rogan sorry. episode I didn't realize you still had more no that's okay I watched the Cat Williams, Joe Rogan episode, and I watched the Cat Williams episode on the Shay Shay podcast where he eviscerated Hollywood and uh-huh. pointed out all the places where you see black comedians wearing dresses and exactly what their deal is. And he doubled down on Rogan. And you've got Rogan, who's already a conspiracy theorist, with Cat Williams, who's a conspiracy theorist and well-read. And these two motherfuckers just go at it and they go deeper and deeper. And each time one of them talks, it's another shovel full. Like you can't dig yourself out of a hole unless you go all the way to China. And they did. Oh, it's fantastic. And I'm not even saying I believe it all. I'm just saying it was fantastic. Interesting. Um, Rogan's one of those shows that every once in a while I can catch it. His shows tend to go so long, though. That inevitably what happens is I have to break it up into chunks. And if I make it back to it, then I'm lucky. I don't listen to a single podcast of his that's less than three hours. Okay. If it's less than three hours, that means he lost interest and tried to make it go longer. And they always they always come across that way. If it's more than three hours, he was interested. It held his attention. It was and a good guess. with it. And that's those are the ones I listen to. And Cat, I think, is like three hours and 25 minutes. Okay. Okay. Remarkable. And Cat Williams turned him down to do uh, the small room or the big room in his um, mothership because okay. he does arenas. And Rogan calls him out in the next podcast, which I'm halfway through now, about saying, like, this guy's missing the boat because he only does arenas. But Cat Williams was like, yeah, I'm not I'm not doing the small club with 200 people. And. He still was on Rogan's podcast. Interesting. Just just remarkable. Interesting. Well, going back to the three cigars we smoked and enjoyed this week. So did you do your second one? Not yet. Okay, what's your second one? My second one is the. Short Robusto by uh, JFR Lunatic uh, in the Habano. It is, I have a box I've been sitting on for a couple years and they have just, they're already good, but when you sit on cigars and you age them the way I do, which is a little dry boxing for a couple months and then back in humidification, they just keep getting better and better and better. And these are just remarkable. So I'm cheating because you can't just go out and buy them. You have to buy them and then do the work. But I did the work and I'm enjoying the shit out of these. Hey, that's okay. Because I've been uh, really high on uh, this box of uh, 
Warhawk Rebellious that I was sitting on for like four years. And I've been very slowly making my way through those because I don't want to burn through them. Super well, that quick, one actually but... needed it from the beginning. Those came out so young because they were a little bit behind the eight ball on their um, their production. It's one of the few times where packaging arrived before the cigars did. Okay. So they needed to get the cigars out. So those came in a little young and it needed time. I so liked them then. Well, your palate's fucked up. I don't know what All to right. tell you. There well, was too much ammonia then. That was four years ago, too. So, you know, I'd only been smoking for like a year and a half at that point. Fair enough. That explains yeah. it. But, yeah, but uh, they, they must be unbelievable now. Oh, dude, the spice level on those things is just out of this world. It's great. But, uh, but my second one um, actually is um, one that I uh, got from the fine folks at J.C. Newman. They sent a nice little care package, and I had uh, El Baton Bellicoso. Love that cigar. Right? Love it. Chocolatey, strong, a little pepper. Amazing draw. Great. And everybody, you know, and here's the thing. They've done a really good job lately of uh, rebranding and reworking some old brands. You know, the the Perla Del Mar, and then now the uh, El Baton. And uh, probably others that I'm forgetting, but um, uh, it doesn't feel like the El Baton gets quite the love that the Perla Del Mar gets. And dude, the El Baton is fantastic. Well, here's going back to that 36 inch thing. El Bat- um, Perla Del Mar is four sizes. It hits 30, I believe it's 32 inches across, but if you merchandise them properly, it's 32 over 32 over 32. And with that block, you can't, you can't not see it. Yeah. So Perla Del Mar gets the love because they have a lot more facings. El Baton is four facings. That's it. It's all the original sizes. The packaging looks exactly the same. First box of cigars I ever bought, by the way. Oh, there you go. Full box. They're back when they were 40 count cabs. Okay. And they did a great job with the re-blend of capturing the original chocolate and spice, but they brought the nicotine down just a touch. Because that original one, you could see into the fucking future was so strong. (laughs) So they tampered that a bit, and they made a better product. Period. Perfect. All right. So what's your third one? Well, my third one is, I'm just going to say it. It's Aladino Corojo Reserve. I'm wearing the hat. Sorry. Uh, it's it's one of my go-tos, although it's going to see a hit in sales this year because the McAuliffe Black Toro is, uh, is taking up an awful lot of real estate, oh, not only in my home God. humidor, but in my regular cigar rotation. Oh, man. Uh, and it, honestly and truly, it's the price point. I am do you realize do... you may have just cost somebody a job because Husto is not going to be able to afford all of his staff at that point because you buy so damn many of those things. Husto is going to do just fine. That's like a big corporate hit right there. Well, in my in my area, he has a broker, so it's oh, whatever okay. the broker sells, the broker sells. <laughs> he gets paid on commission. So the uh, yeah, just the Corolla Reserve is still firing on all cylinders. I still love it. The McAuliffe Black just comes in at a better price point, and it's like if I'm going to smoke three a day, I get it. I can save enough for a whole nother cigar tomorrow. And how many times can you do that? I can do that always because I could afford to smoke Corojo Reserves to begin with. If McAuliffe Black suddenly just stops being as good, I'll go back. But I'm down to two a day of the Corojo Reserves and three of the McAuliffe Blacks. My God. And I save the other two or three cigars, sometimes four, for a new product that comes in or revisiting other stuff. It's like I don't even know you anymore. I don't know. I understand. Um, so, okay. So speaking of go-to cigars, uh, I'm going to go ahead and go with one of my go-tos because I've smoked quite a few of them in the last, you know, five or six days. And that's the uh, uh, Perdomo Habano Sun Grown in the Churchill size. I uh, Great. had some... Uh, reward points at uh, my local total wine and they uh they were plentiful enough that i was able to go in and uh, get a really good deal on a box of those so that worked out really well 
So that's, my only uh, complaint is I don't, I don't like the Churchill size Be- okay. for two reasons. One, you're smoking one cigar for too long. Two, yeah, but see, when I'm in the car for an hour and a half, I don't mind that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're 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 smoking for the first two inches to put smoke in the air, and then it gets to be interesting. Yeah. So that's the other part is that there's not enough flavor changes in a Churchill. If it was me making a Churchill, I would make it so that the consumer smoked an inch flavor change. Two more inches flavor change, two more inches flavor change. And now you're down to the nub and you've got the tar built up and now the cigar starting to get good again. So essentially another flavor change. But what everybody does is the first two inches, it's just nothingness and then you get to where it pops at the five inch mark i just wish there was a little more oomph no that's fair that's fair uh you know and and to my you know back to my point about the driving it's like you know when i'm driving i don't again it's it's kind of like we were talking about the byron i don't want something that i have to actually fully concentrate on i want something that i just know it i like it I can fire it up and I can concentrate on driving, but at the same time have that cigar for, you know, both enjoyment and uh, keeping me awake and we can go from there. But yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. Listen, so. for your, for the purpose that you're using at a church, it'll make sense. Yeah. I get such an aggressive discount on my cigars because I work for a cigar store. Yeah. I just smoke two Robustos. Yeah, see, my problem, I can't drive and light a cigar. I can cut a cigar all day while driving, um, especially considering the uh, the SV holds, you know, the stuff, the schmuckus inside. That's the but best part. The, uh, you know, but, but lighting a cigar properly while driving, I mean, that's a recipe for an accident. And so it's one of those things. Am I pulling over two or three times to fire up Robustos or am I? just going to go with one longer cigar i won't do a gordo or not a gordo uh one of the fucking gigantic ring gauge ones i know a lot of truckers really appreciate the 70 ring gauge plus you sure. know, because it's one of those things they can fire it up and they can go three plus hours on the same cigar i i just don't mouth feels just an issue there i i, I don't like the bigger ring gauge i love a good mouth feel I mean, I get that. I've heard that about you. So you started um, that rumor, you dink. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Okay. Well, uh, why, this is the point with all zooms that I have to go video, which, by the way, I want to clarify. I, I uh, past episode, I heard Dave and, and Ed talking about why does he do the video only? It's because of my board. I only have three buttons available for like you know drops and when i when i plug the board into in this case the ipad so that i can record the audio from the zoom if i didn't i'd have six available but the channel that the ipad takes up those three buttons go away so in order for me to have the other remaining drops i have to stop the audio switch the buttons while we do the video only and then come back so that's so it's, it's you all can't just thing. get an iPhone and have a bank of buttons. I do, but that I can't plug in both the, the iPad and the phone at the same time. I only have the one port, the uh, auxiliary out for me to record Buy your a audio new mixer. Well, I mean, I don't have cigar authority budget like, you know, you it's guys like one hundred and ninety dollars. My board was like four hundred bucks. You overpaid. <laughs> if you need if you need advice on on DJ equipment or mixing equipment, you you know who to talk to. You just tap okay. me in or call Ed Sullivan. We'll get you set up. You have a okay. laptop? I do have a laptop. I need to replace that too. That fucking thing is no. Oh that's my fine. God. Replace the laptop. Get yourself a shitty Windows machine instead of going for your balls on a Mac. But then I you like my Mac. Oh, then get the zero interest. 12 month oh yeah freaking... yeah the well, mac that the i'm mac... broadcasting on right now it was 2400 split up yeah. into 12 payments yeah i'm i'm in the process of looking at that because i need it uh 
not just for i mean realistically i could do the podcast stuff on a on a pc no problem it's the uh it's all the newspaper stuff on my layout and everything it's just so much easier on the mac but such is life well anyway the, the, you so you can write it off completely Oh, yeah. No, this is a business expense. It's just a matter of whether or not the business has the money for it. Let me tell you, there's not a lot of money in newspapers these days. Sell more ads. <laughs> That's easier said than done when you got Mark Zuckerberg out there undercutting you at any moment. Watch Andy Elliott on YouTube. It'll change your life. Okay. Okay. Andy It'll Elliott. Change your life. Andy Elliott. He will change your life. He's the guy that, so we shifted our focus. We talked about it the last time I was on your show. We shifted our focus from the six steps of the sale to Andy Elliott's mentality of mentoring your customer. Okay. So if you, as a business that is a newspaper, if you mentor your customer into understanding that there still are these older people that like to read something in their hands for sure versus just having some sort of digital footprint. The older customer has the money. And this is the mindset of this Andy Elliott guy of overcoming the objections with more facts and mentoring your customers so that they come around to see it in the most truthful way possible, which let's face it, the guy that's retired and can afford to live with his wife of 50 years without working. This is the guy every business should be going after. Oh, and for what, sure. Do you think he's on Facebook? Because the answer is no. His wife might be. He's not. Yep. He reads the newspaper. He looks forward to that newspaper coming in. Every day it comes in, he knows exactly when, and he knows what time. And believe me, he's up and hears the newspaper being launched to his front porch. <laughs> he knows when it happens and he can't wait to read it. This is where you need to be with those customers. Well, I, I don't disagree with you. I make a lot of good points about Facebook and uh, how, you know, when you post to your page, only 16% of your audience max is going to see it unless you boost that post and put money well, behind it. Me. Well, okay. I get 25 to 29% engagement. Oh, look at you. But I cheat. Oh. I make myself live a very interesting life so that when <laughs> someone sees it, they they love it. Like when I post the pictures of this, when it's done, yeah. people, I'll get 250, 300 likes on comments, but I really did the fucking work to do it. Well, I mean, yeah. So see, all of this not... work is so that I can enjoy this room, but also in my mind, I'm like, all right, I took the before pictures. Here's the after pictures and let's have at it. See, I'm not a handy individual. So like me buying a fixer upper house is just not, not a prospect that appeals. I wasn't handy when I bought this house either, but you, when you, when you see the first bill of, uh, with the, I had the, Plumbers look at my, I had a drain that was leaking, a house drain. Yeah. 9,000. Holy shit. Yeah. But I see, learned how to fucking glue PVC together. Well, no. About see, uh, two YouTube videos and $17 later in material. Okay. But see, now your brother's handy, though. Not plumbing, but yes, he is. Well, so yeah. He's no, coming, man, he's coming over later tonight because this window needs to yeah. be measured. So I can buy a vertical slider that has the security locks on it so I could have the window open for ventilation, but not risk somebody coming into the house through the oh, window. Yeah. So I want I want that that type of window there. And so he's going to come over and teach me how to do it. And he's going to point out all the shit I did wrong on this tongue and groove. <laughs> and you know what? It's too fucking late because it's already done. Uh -huh. It's, it's like, done. Well, it looks okay to me. He's going to teach me about expansion gym so I can cover the plaster that's on the side here and I'll get everything I can out of him. And you, for my pocket door, I hired a handyman, not my brother. I hired a handyman to come over every other week and tell me the next thing to do. He didn't touch a single thing. He just, all right, this is the next thing. And at the end, when I owed him the 50 bucks, he was like, I feel funny taking the $50 because I didn't do anything. 
And I said, all right, here, take this box of cigars. I hit a $50 bill in the box at the second row. Oh, nice. So it took him a couple of weeks to get there. And whatever, I, I just learned how to do it. And it's not hard. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, now we're going to go to video only real quick. Okay. So what kind so of wretched shit play. are you going to no, throw not. out there? <laughs> I was going to say, I'm like, what kind of wretched shit are you going to throw out there this time? <laughs> we'll keep them guessing and I won't have anything this time. Oh, well, you know, it happens. I mean, you can't be on all the time. I don't know. Maybe you can. So talk about your dancing that you, you partnered up with uh, Brett. Brett. Yeah. So Brett bought uh, this restaurant and I had asked him um, if he wanted, if he had any interest in getting the word out to about, I got like 475 people on my mailing list. And he said, he absolutely did. And I said, all right, let's, let me throw a swing party. You tell me what you need and I'll throw the swing party and I'll pay you what you want. And I will put your restaurant in front of an active 500 people that live okay. in the area. And to his credit, he said, I don't want anything. If you can put my restaurant in front of 500 people, you can have the room for free. And I said, okay, well, because you give me the room for free, I guarantee you 100 customers will come through your doors and will buy food at your restaurant. And he said, you don't have to guarantee me anything. Just put it out there and whatever. And I'm hovering in the 90s right now of people okay. that I got into his restaurant. And I'm going to throw another party uh, this week. Uh, I'm sorry, next week on Friday. And that should round out the rest of the 10 of people just sitting down ordering food. Uh, he ran an aggressive deal for my followers for the month of February where they got 20% off of anything they bought that was food related and they paid full price for alcohol. And so I got a bunch of people in that way. And it, he's slowly improving the menu. Um, the previous owner kind of took his eye off the ball a little bit, but he's got his eye on the ball and he's bringing in professionals to teach his staff how to and what to do and it's taken it to another level i'm watching it transform in front of me because i go in every other week and starting this week i'll be going in every week so uh just watching him grow as a business owner and watching the company grow it's awesome i'll tell you what you you want to talk about an industry that is so hard and that i just I tip my hat to anybody who gets into it because my God, the, 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 the failure rate is there and, and just everything else. But like, you know, kudos to him for getting into restaurants because I mean, he's done it is, a couple of times ridiculous. in his career. He's been able to turn and burn a couple of restaurants and be able okay. to bring them up to reasonable glory and then sell them off. So okay. he definitely knows what he's doing and he is coming in with, he bought it from an absentee owner of about three years. So okay. that the inmates were running the asylum for a little while and he's getting that shit cleaned up to another level, which is great. And what is the name of his restaurant for anybody who it's happens called to called the be Roma, in that area? the Roma, the Roma, in Haverhill, that? Massachusetts, Haverhill, Massachusetts. Okay. Well, very cool. Well, why don't we go back to the audio now? And we're back on the audio. And that's why butt plugs require <laughs> copious amounts of lube because otherwise it's just painful. You don't want to get them stuck. You don't. Mm -mm. In or out. Let's be real. The EMS people, they're not, or EMT, they're they are not going to be polite to you, you know. And forget about ATM with those guys. I've asked for it. And oh, won't dear do God. It. I, so, okay. All right. I have a funny story. And I may have told this on the show before. But um, so back in a previous life, I worked in politics. And I'm on a conference call with another strategist and the candidate. And we're talking about putting together a website as kind of an opposition dump about this candidate's opponent. And we're talking about how all of the family members of this, of the, op the opponent's family 
are all employed by different units of government. And, you know, they, they're just involved in everything. Like one was a congressman, one was a president of a community college. This one was a, a state representative. And there's just and there's more. And, you know, so we're trying to come up with a clever name for this website, a clever URL. And the other strategist throws out, what about the idea of Costello Family ATM? You know, because oh, meaning, God. meaning, meaning, you know, automated teller machine. Right. And so this candidate, she just immediately. No, we can't do that. And we're like, why not? She goes, ATM. And we're like, both of us, both me and this other strategist, we're both just like, what, what what's wrong with that? And she goes, well, you guys know what that means, right? And we're like, no, why don't you No, tell we're not us? in that world, lady. And, and and I'm like, well, no. And I respond like, automated teller machine. And she goes, oh. To which we're both just like, well, what did you think it meant? No, 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 it's okay. No, seriously, tell us, what did you think that meant? Well, ass to mouth. And I lost my fucking mind, dude. I that that was the first time I had encountered that. It was the first time the other strategist encountered that. And we're just losing our mind. And she's all embarrassed and everything else. And uh, we moved on. We didn't use that one. But uh, holy shit, it was educational. I'll say that much. It was funny. That's awesome. And I actually still suspect that she was a high priced prostitute. She was a her 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 profession was a business consultant and, you know, she was making like six figures a year doing, you know, business consulting. But we never knew any of her clients. She never like she always was available to do stuff. So it's like, when when do you do this consulting work? And uh, yeah, so we, we suspected maybe that she was a high priced prostitute or something, but neither or here nor there. regular one. I, maybe. I mean, I don't know. You know, um, she had a really nice house. And her husband was, was like a chef. How was her ass? So, um, I mean, I wouldn't put my mouth on it, but, you know, it wasn't bad. I'm not I'm I'm not exactly sure that that's what ATM stands for. Ass to mouth. Yeah, I'm not. I'm pretty sure it has to do with some sort of penetration and then in the oh oh well anyway i well then i may have just learned more off of this story there i don't know (laughs) anyway we'll we'll move on you know what this is a very appropriate time to play this this would normally be the time that i give some information about my monthly cigars but i've hired that out this week so take it away My Monthly Cigars is a premium cigar subscription service. It comes in a variety of different size boxes at affordable prices. Use offer code PULPIT and get free shipping on your first box and 20% off any items in the online store at MyMonthlyCigars.com. That's offer code PULPIT. Thanks. Different size boxes. You know... (laughs) <laughs> it seemed like for the longest time, anytime we were talking about anything related to butts or poop, it always uh, then prompted the My Monthly ad. So it just seemed like an appropriate thing to do. Um, and uh, by the way, for those of you who enjoy uh, coffee, he does have the fucking good coffee, which I have been drinking out of my my little travel mug here. And uh, that comes in a variety of flavors that you can get over there at the website. And I have it on fairly good account. I don't want to like break any news or anything like that, but I have it on fairly good account that those people that are coming to the new England cigar expo, uh, should probably be looking forward to trying some fucking good coffee. They probably should. Yeah. They should look forward to it, whether it's going to happen or not. I don't know, but they should look forward to it. (laughs) Well, like I said, I don't want to break any news or anything, so I'll let you guys do that. So yeah, that that all that that news all came about, you know, last week. Yeah, it's uh it's such a big event. So I introduced David to the tent and I said they're open to cigar smoking and we're <laughs> looking for a place to do the anniversary party. And he shit all over the tent and was like no fucking way, this is not 
high end enough for the anniversary party. It's not what we're looking for. And then two weeks later, he goes, okay, we're throwing an expo and we're going to do our anniversary party the first night and then do the other thing the second day. And I'm like, wait, you said it wasn't high end enough for the first night. Uh huh. No, no, no. If it's an expo, it's okay to be in a tent. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I have a question and you may or may not even know the answer to this. I don't know why I did it, but for some reason recently, I went back super, super, super far into the history of your show on, on iTunes, like way back to the freaking beginning. And I don't remember why I, I can't remember why I did that. I had a reason. Um, and in one of the episodes fairly early, I saw reference to a new england cigar expo did dave do this before not that i'm aware of okay i'll have to dig back unless maybe apple was like screwing up and showing me show notes from a current show on a old show but i thought that is, i that's more likely it's possible because i mean you know glitches abound but i don't know why i just i i, I meant to ask that but um well, you know, as much as I'm looking forward to uh, the New England Cigar Festival, I want to let everybody know that uh, the um, ticketing page for Pulpit Fest 2024 is now available. And so if you go over to uh, eventbrite.com, that's B-R-I-T-E, uh, eventbrite.com, and you just click uh, search. Where, where is it? There we go. Uh, you, ser- you click search. And I'm doing it right now just to make sure that this is accurate. I probably should have done that prior to this. Um, no worries. I have all day. I'm on vacation. Now why in the hell is it? And and I think officially I'm drunk. Well, there you go. Why is it doing? Uh, there it is. Yeah. So if you click uh, search and you just search for Pulpit Fest, all one word, you should be able to find. Uh, well, that looks like shit. Um, you should if, be able uh, to find the page there if i went to events i would totally go to pulpit fest oh i mean i get it but i don't go to events why not i don't i don't like them Uh, this is this is gonna sound a little goofy i'm totally an introvert what i recharge when i'm by myself no one around and i just have a podcast or i have music on the bluetooth speaker and I'm just chilling by myself. That's when I'm at my happiest. I mean, I get that. When I have to be in front of people or I'm performing or whatever, mm. it's Nobody's a asking drain. You to perform. <laughs> Nobody's asking have to, you to perform. If I have to go to an event, it's a performance. Okay. Okay. Um, and well, I only anyway. go out into crowds yeah. if I'm being paid to do so. Okay. Otherwise, oh. I would rather not be paid and just be by myself. That's fair enough. I mean, I get that. Um, but for those of you who uh, are interested in Pulpit Fest, head on over to eventbrite.com. Search for Pulpit Fest. You'll find it. Um, tickets are free, but we just need the head count. Um, it's one of Why? those things. Why are tickets free? Because, by God, I have to... You know, I want to it's a it's a party for my listeners, man. I want to make it want to make it nice for the people. It's going to yeah, be fun. Listen, your podcast is the third most popular uh, fourth fourth most popular podcast uh, fourth to none um, in the world say, of cigars. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I was going to say, don't be counting none in there. <laughs> I mean, that's worth something. I mean, I get it, but, you know, I'm also asking people to travel to Florida this year. So, you know, there's expense involved. Why Florida? uh, uh, Because Ken down in Ash and Ale in Palm Coast, Florida, has graciously agreed to uh, to host this year. And, uh, dude, this place is really, really nice. It's in the this facility called the European Village. So it's like three buildings that kind of make a triangular shape. It's got a great courtyard area, lots of bars and restaurants in the bottom floors. 
and uh, he's got his little cigar shop. So we're gonna have a great outdoor indoor thing going on. And all right, so it'll be next fun. year. Next year, hit me up. Two guys smoke shop Salem. We'll uh, host your. your oh fest. shit! Oh, see, and it'll be a month before the New England Cigar Festival or Expo. I'm just saying. My God, look at that! Well, I like. If the you're idea. not willing to charge, I am. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't see the value in uh, you i do you know i see the value in me but i just like hanging out with my listeners they're fun people it's 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 a nice party we're actually we've got all kinds of stuff planned we're we're talking like a scavenger hunt and uh we've got uh some special guests that are coming up because that's the thing miami's only four hours south so you know it's easy for some of these guys to travel up and, Do you know uh, what Shane Gillis would say about what I've heard so far about your your fest? What's that? It's gay. That son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not. It's the most straight and heterosexual. <laughs> it's not. It's, it's not it's at all. Totally, totally. <laughs> you actually made it sound more appealing to me. That's how I knew. It oh was gay. dear God, dear God! No, it's been nice. I've I was like, ah, seen... you know what? I could see myself going to that. It's been nice. I've actually seen some back and forth between listeners talking about, "Hey, I'm renting an Airbnb. It's got room for eight. Who wants to share? You know that." How kind many of thing. other I mean, dudes would like to share this room with me? I, well, I don't know about that. I mean, some people are bringing their families down because it's a nice Florida trip, you know. So we're only an hour and a half from Orlando, so they can go off and, you know praise at the altar of the cult of the mouse while you know we over we're over here smoking cigars how is how is that not the gayest thing you've said so far in the podcast oh dude my ex-wife was a, a what they call a disney adult and let me tell you i am not a disney person at the it, like it is a straight up cult man these people that are like i know exactly what food stand sells churros and dole whip and you know did you know that this ride is shut down for a period of time because of this and blah it's fucking ridiculous that is ridiculous have you, have you not encountered a disney adult yet there's there there are some in my close proximity yeah yeah it's a cult dude like Ed, Ed, our buyer's like, wife, does she does the booking for Disney, and she does the booking so that she can go like thirty seven times a year for free. Well, and but she she at least works for them, you know. She's just feeding the beast, man. True, it's That's not true. cool. No, I know. I mean, let me tell you, my ex wife, she lives, you know, here in Southern Illinois, and. uh I know last year she and my son had season passes to Disney World in Florida. And I'm thinking, you live in Illinois. What are you doing? With but whatever, whatever, you know, such is life. I've been plenty of times. I don't need to go again. So although Epcot's fun, you get to drink around the world. You got to take or, out a mortgage to do it. But, or, you know, yeah. And, and just hear me out on this for about three weeks worth of work and some uh, measuring two or three times and cutting once you could just have yourself a Shangri-La of cigar smoking. And after like three days, it's free. This is true. I mean, compared to being at Epcot. So I could just, I'm just saying, if I had to go to a Disney park. I could just drink this scotch right here. <laughs> Holy shit, you got a new free. one. No, this is not a new one. I peed in it while we were uh, <laughs> on break. I, and I honestly, I was, looking I up close it was, close. I was panicking because I, <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was so close to going ahead and making that joke. And uh, like, no, no. And then you did it. <laughs> I did it. Well, I, oh, I didn't know if it, was, if it was socially acceptable to just be like, can you pause the podcast? I have to pee so bad. So I just drop trial with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine windows in this room. <laughs> and I just hoped hey, you're in that your the house. couch railing was high enough that the neighbors didn't call the cops. You're in your house. That's all that matters. 
And honestly, if the cops show up, I'm going to be like, dude, I'm just drinking the scotch right here and I'll drink it right in front of them. I'm not even scared. I mean, the first time it's, it's, you know, supposed to be what sterile after that is when it gets bad. How many times have you drank your own urine? Never, but it's one of those like, you know, survival tips. It's like you can drink the first time after that. It's bad. Do, do you think I would get drunker if I drank that urine? I mean, there might be some alcohol in it. I'll, I'll let you know how it goes. Okay. All right. Keep me posted. Um, well, in terms of the socials, I'm on Instagram at the Cigar Pulpit, I'm also on Facebook where we have the Pulpit Parishioners group, and uh, I did pin the uh, link to the Eventbrite page on there. So if you're in that group and you want to get your tickets, just look in the uh, featured post section on that, and you can get in on that. I'm on Twitter slash X and YouTube where you can check out the bottle of Mr. Jonathan's pee. It's uh, it's not that great the second time around. The pee? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not saying it's going to be great the second time around. I'm just saying that, you know, I was kind of hoping it would be like you can do it double malt scotch, but it wasn't. It was no, it was like pee. Very ammonia ish. Yeah. You got to watch out for kidney infections if you've got too much ammonia going on. It's not so much that it was ammonia, it just was like salty and disgusting. <laughs> oh, <my> God. <laughs> It was like salty Chinese pea pods. If that, if that makes sense. <laughs> like edamame. <laughs> exactly. It was edamame. Edamame. Holy fuck. Where are you on social media? I am on the Facebooks. Jonathan, Mr. J. Barbo, B-A-R-B-E-A-U. I am on X as Mr. Jonathan. And I'm on the MeWees as Mr. Jonathan. I'm on the MeWe. I just don't get on there too often. I need to get on there more. I also have a website, MrJonathanIsMyDJ.com. If you're anywhere close to interested in swing dancing, that's all I do. I got offered some serious money to take up DJing again. And I said, no fucking way. I could be, I literally could just be the DJ for the Roma restaurant. And I said, I'm sorry, Brett. I'm out. I'm not. I'm not doing it's it. Just, it's just one more thing. One more commitment. It's not even that. It's I am not dealing with people anymore. When it's my students and they paid to be in a class, I can abuse the shit out of them. Yeah. I can just do it my way and it's my way or the highway. But if I'm DJing, there has to be a level of customer service with the music <laughs> and I'm not doing it. No, I'm not doing it. I'm That's not. fair. You just don't want to hear celebration by cool and the gang ever again. If that were the thing, <laughs> I would do it. I love oh. that song. I love yeah, it. Yeah, but oh God. I'm over it. I've heard it entirely too much in my life. I'm over Me it. Me too, but that one. I, it's it's one of those songs that's a good song that's overplayed. Yeah. But it's oh, a good it's song and I can tolerate it. It's the, and I just had this conversation with this uh, girl I'm seeing. She said, initially I was on my way to a gig and she goes, do you take requests? And I go, yeah, I take requests. She goes, well, why did you say it like that? And I go, well, I don't play them unless I was <laughs> going to play them anyways. It's like, yeah, she goes, well, that's, them. that's bad customer service, but the person wants to hear it and they're the customer. And I go, well, they're not my customer. My customer hired me to play the gig. These people came to the gig and thought, oh, I could be a DJ. And then they asked for this obscure Beck song that <laughs> I might even like. <laughs> I might like the Beck song. Yeah. But it's going to kill the dance floor because no one's say, ever heard of it. It's going to so kill the room. I take the requests and I don't play them because that guy is not as good as I am. I'm the best one. And that's See, why I, I got the gig. I'm that guy that messes with the touch tunes jukebox. I actually was just over at, uh, there's this Mexican restaurant just across the river and they, uh, have a touch tunes in their, in their bar and it feeds the music for the whole restaurant. So the whole time it's playing the, like, you know, the typical Mexican restaurant, you know, mariachi you roll these motherfuckers? Oh, I didn't Rick roll. I played afternoon delight by the cast of anchor man. 
So like it's like you know mariachi shit, and then it's like right into fucking Will Ferrell and the gang singing Afternoon Delight, and then right back into mariachi shit. So good, and it was amazing. So then near the end of my meal, I enjoyed that so much, I wanted to do another one. And so my second one that I did was the Muppets singing Bohemian Rhapsody. And let me tell you, when Animal gets to the part that he's all mama, 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 it's it just kills. It just fucking killed. Yeah. So I want to be the guy who plays that, but I don't <laughs> want to be the guy who is someone gets to play that. Uh, OK, so I'll do it, but I won't do it if it's someone else's idea. I tap out last that year. That said, same- if Brett called me and was like, I got this wedding booked and the DJ bailed. How quickly can you be here? Yeah, I'll be there. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's he's my friend and I'll I'll help him. But for sure, I'm not I'm not doing it like as my regular thing anymore. I gotcha. I gotcha. Last year on St. Patrick's Day, I'm sitting up at this bar and I'm enjoying life. And I just start hearing you're drunk on green beer uh, and Irish car bombs. But yeah. And so uh, basically. And so um, I just keep hearing fucking coming uh, the the dropkick Murphys, the, you know, coming down to Boston or whatever it is. And it's like constant shipping up to Boston. That's it. That's it. That's the one. And I'm just like, it's just constant. So I decide I'm going to mix it up and I throw on um, Amazing Grace on the bagpipes. And amazing fucking i watched that bar the whole mood of it just dropped to the floor you got people sitting there just mourning loved ones and whatnot and then as soon as it's over fucking shipping out to boston comes right back on and everybody's right back to normal but for those few minutes oh, i controlled the room and it was amazing so magical and that's the reason why i don't take requests well i take them <laughs> but i don't play them but i don't want someone having that level of control other than me because i can be trusted these yeah. motherfuckers cannot be trusted. And then the best part about it, it's all on the app. So nobody knows who actually played that shit. Because these motherfuckers are you. And you can't exactly. be trusted. <laughs> played Amazing Grace. Oh, dude, it was so brilliant. It kicked in and the fucking bagpipes are going. And I'm just like, oh, I was loving it. It was amazing. Uh, after the podcast, go ahead and listen to Annie DeFranco's version of Amazing Grace. And it will blow your mind you'll actually listen to it as a song not amazing grace you'll be like i need to hear this song again that song so good it just gets me right here every time like i just can't help it so admittedly i took myself down by doing it too but this is nick miller i need he's completely sober i'm telling you as drunk jonathan which if you have a problem with my behavior right now you take it up with me as drunk Jonathan another time. Sober <laughs> Jonathan will remember this. <laughs> That's the beauty of it being recorded is that it's always there. I'm not listening to it. There you go. There you go. Oh, shit. Well, I have finished my my brick house, Ciento Port Ciento. I didn't even talk about it. We haven't even talked about yours. Like, you can get, you know, what, what Dude, what's up with yours? This is so fucking good. And right now is where it starts to shine and the podcast is ending. So I'm going to be able to do exactly what I love doing, smoking by myself. There you go. No one watching and just enjoying <laughs> the shit out of this final third on this Alfonso number four. It's so amazing. Perfect. I I dug my brick house. It was good. Uh, like I said, it's that it's like a brick house that knows somebody. And uh, speaking of which, I want to give uh, a special thanks to um listener seth because let me just make sure i I need to get the exact notes as to what it was he sent me uh but uh he said he got a deal on some uh brick house dragon fire and he got the jose gaspar the the gasparilla cigars that they put out down there in tampa and uh, he sent me some of those, and uh, I haven't had a chance. They've been sitting in my humidor. I haven't smoked one yet, but uh, I really want to thank him for thinking of me. That was very nice. So if you had a candle that had the genuine essence of cedar. Okay. 
and a back note of oak. And you blew that candle out and you could en masse absorb that aroma. That's the flavor that I'm at right now. Cedar and oak from a candle being blown out. And it's just amazing. Nice. It's amazing. Well, I can I can tell you've got the aroma going because it is. I mean, it's not like thick to where I can't see you, but it is definitely hazy. Fucking cloudy in here. Than it used than it was when we started. And it ain't just so. the windows being smoked out. This, I know this needs to be replaced, and it will be. But yeah, this is great. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad for you. So. Well, dude, seriously, thank you so much for taking time out. I know it was last minute and I know you're on vacation, so it was greatly appreciated that you you came on with me today. Absolutely. My pleasure. And to keep up the good work, my man. I appreciate that. So, well, guys, this has been another sermon from the Cigar Pulpit. I'm Nick. And that's Mr. Jonathan taking a drink. You goddamn right. Stay safe and stay bonerific. See, I remembered from last time. So great. I remembered from last time. You need to come up with a clever acronym for Chubbs, by the way. So that this like new cigar smoker thing that you guys were talking about on Saturday's show can can be a thing and actually be called Chubbs. The thing that's the best part about this is Dave is so tongue in cheek and so WWE WWF wrestling about the show, but mm -hmm. it legitimately pisses him off with the whole boner thing. He <laughs> fucking hates it so much. Well, it's because like he chose, you know, you guys chose stars. Which I get it, you know, it's 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 friendly. But boners was the best one. But the thing is, is like you've kind of just like slyly and just constantly just reinforced boners to where like it can be stars, but everybody it's knows it's boners. boners. Yeah, it's boners. It's That's so funny good. as shit. That's funny. Oh, by the way, speaking of Dave, before we go, um, your little revelation uh, the last time you were on, I dude, with him giving you shit about it. When on your show, my numbers for your last episode spiked out the roof because everybody wanted to hear what you were talking about. Awesome. Yep. So, you know, love that worked out well for me. So thanks, man. All right. Thank you. Okay.